Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar today. I'm Mayor MacArthur, Art and Cultural Director of Japan House Los Angeles. Today, we're delighted to have our special guests, Duncan Williams and Miwako Tezuka here for our second webinar relating to the exhibition, Reconnecting, A Vision of Unity by Kengo Kito. Their presentations and discussion today will explore areas of affinity between Zen Buddhist teachings and works of contemporary Japanese art. But before we meet our guests, I'd like to introduce President of Japan House LA, Yuko Kaifu, who would like to say a few words of welcome. Thank you, Mayor. Hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to our webinar today. Our current exhibition, Reconnecting, A Vision of Unity by Kengo Kito, celebrates reconnecting with our loved ones, our friends, families, and communities after a long period of isolation under the pandemic. It also contains a strong message of unity in diversity, one of the core themes of the Tokyo 2020 Olympic and Paralympic Games, which is coming up in less than 10 days, actually. Although Mr. Kito is a contemporary artist who works with very modern and unique materials such as colorful hula hoops, his approach to his work is very philosophical too. While building his structure out of hoops, he explores the relationship between lines, circles, and space, and the interconnectivity of humanity. Our speakers today, Dr. Duncan Williams and Dr. Miwako Tezuka, are both great friends of Japan House LA and have been providing us with precious pieces of advice over a number of years. Through their discussion today, we will learn more connections between Zen Buddhism and contemporary art from their respective fields of expertise. It will be an exciting and interesting discussion through which I'm sure that we learned a lot more about connections and relationship between the contemporary art and the traditional way of thinking of Japanese philosophy. I'm sure and I'm looking forward to learning more about the interconnectivity of humanity. If you haven't visited our gallery with this exhibition, which will be on until September the 6th, please come visit us. And even if you have visited already, please come back again with a new perception and approach talking about the relationship between the two distinctly different areas, but interconnected. So I hope you enjoyed the program today. And now I'd like to turn back to Mayor. Thank you, Yuko. Now, first, before we meet our speakers, I have to go over some housekeeping announcements. So please turn your attention to the screen. The audience has been muted and videos are turned off. The audience chat is enabled if you'd like to follow it. But if you'd like to send questions to the speakers, please use the Zoom Q&A tool and we'll select as many questions as we can before the end of the webinar. And we'll be recording this webinar and we'll post an edited version on our website soon. Now, I'm delighted to start our conversation about Zen Buddhist philosophy and Japanese contemporary art. In the case of Kengo Kito's work, Zen Buddhist teachings did not inspire his hula hoop installations. Kito-san doesn't actually practice Zen Buddhism. However, his process of connecting hula hoops together to fill spaces is deeply philosophical and one that we believe has an affinity with certain Zen Buddhist teachings and practices, particularly regarding lines, circles, and filling space. Our speakers today will give brief presentations on aspects of Zen Buddhist philosophy and the works of several contemporary Japanese artists, including Kengo Kito himself. Then we'll have a brief discussion about topics in their talk and take questions from the audience. Now, our first speaker today is Duncan Williams. Dr. Duncan Duke M. Williams is currently Professor of Religion and East Asian Languages and Cultures at the University of Southern California and the Director of the USC Shinso Ito Center for Japanese Religions and Culture. Previously, he held the Shinjo Ito Distinguished Chair of Japanese Buddhism at UC Berkeley and for four years served as the director of Berkeley Center for Japanese Studies. Duncan has also been ordained as a Buddhist priest in the Soto Zen tradition since 1993 and served as the Buddhist chaplain at Harvard University from 1994 to 96. He's the author of The Other Side of Zen, A Social History of Soto Zen Buddhism in Tokugawa, Japan, and American Sutra, a story of faith and freedom in the Second World War. 
Welcome, Duncan. It's great to have you with us. Well, thank you, Mayor, and uh, thank you, Yuko, for inviting me to join you today. You know, I'm going to try in a very brief period of time to talk a little bit about the connection between this new uh, artwork and Zen Buddhist thought and imagery. And to do so, I wanted to start by sharing my screen here, by sharing my screen and talking to you about the circle that I think you saw at the very top in the video that my good friend Shumio Kojima from Zen Juju Temple, I think you saw him do the Enso or that Zen circle. Uh, Enso is literally circle or circular form. And it's often done with as a single brush stroke. But I want to talk a little bit about where did that come from? What are the roots of the idea of the practice of you know, using a brush stroke to make a circle? Where does that come from in the Buddhist tradition in general, in the Zen Buddhist tradition in particular? And the first screen I'm showing you is uh, something where you can see this. It's a kind of document or a lineage chart that uh, one receives when one is ordained into a Zen Buddhist kind of monastic order. And what you'll notice is that it's a lineage chart of what they call the ancestors or those who've come before in the Zen tradition. Hard to make out the Japanese there, but you can see it says Shakamuni Dayosho, Makakasho Dayosho, Ananda Dayosho, and it lists all the disciples of the Buddha, Shakamuni Buddha starting, and all the way down, it, it will reach your teacher, and then your name gets put in at the very end. So this is the type of document that you may receive as you become part of this lineage of teaching and tradition. And you can see that this is considered almost like a bloodline. That's why it's a kind of red color. But these are teachers that taught teachers that taught teachers. And then the question is, who taught the Buddha? And this chart gives us a little bit of a hint. And it's the, one of the kind of most important Zen circles. You see this empty circle at the very top. And it's suggesting to us that the Buddha's teacher was emptiness itself that which is beyond any particular name, any particular form, has a form of a circle. And so that's one of the first hints as to what the Enso or the Zen circle is about. It's about gesture towards, in form, a gesture towards the form less. And so I think most of us might be familiar with this very classic Zen circle, the so-called 10 ox herding pictures and the scrolls and poetry that related to it. And this particular one is in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, but the poetry is linked to uh, Kakuan Xian, the famous 12th century Chan or Zen master in China. And what we find is that in medieval China, it became kind of the practice to draw these Zen circles in honor of the formless or in honor of that which is beyond words and letters as often is attributed to the Chan or Zen tradition. And the notion of emptiness, I think, is something that even goes one step further back to India. And probably uh, some of you would know that the great Indian Buddhist philosopher Nagarjuna is the theorist from the second to third century that really captures this idea that all existence and all things are without essence or self-nature, and he called that emptiness. And by legend, whenever Nagarjuna taught, it said that he appeared in the form of this luminous circle to manifest or show to people and to reveal to people the true nature of what it means to be a Buddha, which is emptiness in a circle. And so that's the kind of earliest roots that we can find of this notion of emptiness and circle and the kind of ultimate truth or nature of oneself as being represented by an enso or this kind of circular form. Probably after Nagarjuna, the most well-known figure that is connected to this idea of the circle is the founder, putative founder of Zen Buddhism himself, Bodhidharma, or in Japanese, we would say Dharma Daishi the first patriarch from India that takes this tradition to China. One of his names is the great teacher of circle enlightenment. And so from the very beginning of the Zen Buddhist tradition, this idea of the circle as representative of enlightenment, of representative of emptiness is very much at the heart of the tradition. And by the next teacher on the lineage chart, 
a third Zen patriarch, Kanchi Sosan, in the sixth century, he says in his very important text, Shinjin Me, the faith in mind text, he talks about a circle as being a vast space lacking nothing, nothing in excess. That's the famous phrase he uses in that text, a vast space lacking nothing, nothing in excess. And from his period on, what we find is a tradition that talks about these circles in two different kinds of metaphors. One is the moon, that the circle represents this kind of orb in the sky that shrinks to nothing yet comes back fully. And the metaphor is of one's true nature or Buddha nature being at times bright and at times darker, sometimes with cloud covering in front, sometimes the clouds go away, but something hidden that you need to discover. And the other metaphor that's used is the mirror. The great 13th century Japanese Zen master, Dogen, talks about the great round mirror. There's a chapter in his famous work, the Shobo Genzo. Dogen lived from like 1200 to 1253, but his magnus opus, the Shobo Genzo, the chapter in there, Kokyo, the ko is old or ancient, Kokyo mirror. And he talks about by looking into the mirror of this round mirror, you can see everything, the past, present, and future. You can see all the Buddhas. And so he has this idea that's very much a part of classical literature that the circle represents a type of mirror to us. And so I wanted to very briefly just go through this idea that this circle is one kind of point in a journey in the Zen Buddhist tradition. And within this 10 ox herding pictures, you can see, I'm gonna go through this very quickly because I don't have a lot of time, but you can see this kind of journey of a person trying to discover who they are and they use the ox animal as this kind of metaphor for your true self. And this person goes on a journey, can't find anything. So it starts with this idea of searching for the ox and in some sense, searching and failing to see the ox. The poem talks about exhausted and dispirited. One hears only the late autumn cicadas shrilling in the maple woods. So you can't quite see your true self at, at, in the beginning of this 10 part journey. But eventually you see you get a glimpse of that ox. And in time in Zen practice, it's thought that you seize the ox or become settled with your true self. And that over time, that settling comes to be one where you can walk together with your true self, ride ox even, but that eventually you come home. And that home is where your true self and your manifest form merges and there's no separation between the searcher and that which is being searched. And so by the time you get to the insole, that circle that we began with, the poem says, whip, rope, man, and ox are all non-existent, meaning it's now entered this land of emptiness, which is where you join the ancient teachers, that lineage of teachers uh, that starts with that Zen circle in the Kechi Myaku we talked about at the beginning. And so one of the things I wanted to point out was that that circle, though, is not the conclusion. That's not the end of the 10-part journey. The ninth and 10th circles show that it's not an empty circle, but as you come into oneness, the kind of theme of this exhibit at Japan House, you find that there is no separation at all with everything as it is, nature as it is, flower, uh, rivers flowing tranquilly, the flowers simply being red. That's the poem that gets associated with this one. So the natural world as it is, nothing extra. And then the last of the journey, last picture of the journey shows Hote, this uh, deity that is thought to be the future Buddha, Maitreya Buddha. Your own kind of potential to become a Buddha gets manifest in this form where you enter, it says he enters the city barefoot and checks exposed, covered in dust and ashes, meaning you've entered back into the dusty world. It's not some kind of nirvanic place that you dwell in, but the journey ends re-entering the marketplace, re-entering ordinary mundane life. So very quick point I wanted to make in my presentation is that that circle is not some kind of ultimate or static state, but it's one part of a longer journey of self-discovery. 
And I'm going to end with this. Dogen, in a different chapter of that text I mentioned, Genjo Koan, he has these lines. To study the Buddha way is to study the self. To study the self is to forget the self. To forget the self is to be actualized by the 10,000 things. And when actualized by the 10,000 things, yours and others' body minds drops away and no trace of realization remains. And this no trace continues endlessly. So this is where I think it, this is linked to Mr. Kengo Kita's work that he, when he talks about the hula hoops as being one that when enclosed, he calls it senga en naru. So the line becomes a circle. But when the hula hoop is opened, he talks about it as a flip side of that, which is that enga sen ni naru. So the circle becomes a line. And so whether we close or open the circle, these things are interlinked, just like as Dogen is saying, our cells and the Buddha is interlinked. And that when we attain that journey, that this temple journey, and let go of that small self, let go of the ox, become one with the 10,000 things, which in classical literature just means the whole world. Then, in fact, that Zen circle of no trace of realization, that can continue forever. So I'm happy to talk more about all of these concepts uh, that I think are at the root and the source of what is a Enso and a Zen circle, some of these ideas. But uh, I will now turn it back over to uh, my colleague, uh, Yoko and Mayor to introduce us. Thank you so much, Duncan. That was fascinating. I wish I could be one of your students at USC. <laughs> I have so many questions and thoughts rushing around in my head. My head is not empty right now. We'll be hearing from Duncan again in a few minutes, but now we'll be hearing from our second speaker, Miwako Tezuka. Dr. Miwako Tezuka is Associate Director of the Reversible Destiny Foundation, a progressive artist foundation in New York established by Arakawa and Madeleine Ginz. Previously, she was Gallery Director of Japan Society in New York and Curator of Contemporary Art at Asia Society Museum, also in New York. She is also active as an independent curator, and her current projects include the 2022 Hawaii Triennial. She has curated numerous exhibitions, including the groundbreaking exhibition Yoshitomo Nara, Nobody's Fool, at Asia Society Museum in 2010. Miwako holds a doctorate in post-war Japanese art history from Columbia University and is co-director of Ponja Genkong, post-1945 Japanese art discussion group, Gendai Bijutsu Kondankai, a global online network of post-1945 Japanese art scholars and curators. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome to the screen, Miwako Tezuka. Hello, hi. Thank you, Mayor, for kind introduction. So now I'm going to share my screen. So um, again, thank you so much for uh, letting me join this webinar. And I'm with you, Mayor. I would love to be Duncan's student and learn more about Zen Buddhism. So today I'm just going to quickly go through some of the key works in contemporary Japanese art by a few Japanese artists, including Kengo Kito, whose works may show affinities or even direct visual conversation with the philosophy of Zen. To me, the story of the 10 ox herding is a story of finding your authentic self. So I think I'm happy that I'm reading the pictures kind of okay way in my own manner. So when I work with contemporary artists, I am most interested in artists who are searching for exactly that, the authentic self. But depending on each artist, it manifests in different forms and mediums that enable them to express their thoughts and philosophy that are deeply consuming them at the moment of creation. In the case of Kengo Kito, his authentic self seen, sees the world as a great continuum, which is the theme that keeps him curious, inquisitive, and analytical. As an artist trained first in painting, he seeks to visualize this abstract concept of continuum in space and time. And since his early phase of his career, he has used a variety of forms and mediums such as painting, sculpture, and installation. Even his work in the 
perhaps the most conventional medium of painting on canvas, you will notice how his use of glitter and rhythmic lines bouncing all over the frame space constantly challenges the border of the painting that is limiting the space of existence. Staring at his lines and colors, your eyes are affected to perceive the worldly space with different sensations. I think there is always a phenomenological aspect to all of his works. The way Kito's art brings a kind of mind alteration in a way offering a potential to see the world anew may have an affinity to a religious practice like Zen practice of meditation or koan riddles. There are many other contemporary Japanese artists who find affinity between their interpretation of the world and our existence in the world and the Buddhist philosophy, particularly in its way of contemplating on all things being transient and yet also being aware of the circle of life and death. An example that is perhaps clearly defined as a work in dialogue with Buddhism in general is Hiroshi Sugimoto's Five Elements. He has long been fascinated with the form of pagoda, starting from his visits to temples like Horyuji and Yakushiji in his high school years to more recent years. And it also deepened when he acquired one of the Horyuji Hyakumanto, the One Million Pagodas and the Rani Prayers, which is miniature wooden pagoda. The form of his five elements is a reflection of esoteric Buddhist cosmology that have also been incorporated in various degrees into Zen Buddhist teachings. A cube is earth, a sphere is water, triangle is fire, hemisphere is wind, and emptiness or space is represented by a jewel on top. You can see the correlation with the representation of Zen cosmology in the famous combination of a circle, triangle, and a square. From the contemporary artist's perspective, what interests Hiroshi Sugimoto is how a religion works as an examination of human consciousness. And throughout the history, the mankind has attempted to give a visible form to such examination. The five elemental forms are an example. Sugimoto finds a connection to this historical journey and joins this journey of the mind by incorporating his ongoing photographic series of seascape through which he captures not only the passage of time through usage of long exposure photography, but also the very first image that his human consciousness has engraved in his memory. Another example that comes to mind is the work of Mariko Mori. Those who are familiar with her early photographic and video works might first remember the images in which the artist herself appears dressed like a shaman or a flying aspsara or a city bodhisattva in the lotus position. The specific reference to of those early works was to, again, the esoteric school of Buddhism, but similar to Hiroshi Sugimoto, at the core of her interest is the aspect of Buddhism as an exploration of human consciousness. As Sugimoto has done in his five elements by shedding other extraneous elements from his expression, Mariko Mori has come to focus on primary forms in more recent years compared to her early, more pop-oriented works. An example of one of her minimalist approaches to expression is Ring, as you see on the screen now. It's from an installation at New York's Japan Society. The work is made of lucite, a kind of resin that reflects light in shifting tones from white to blue, depending on the angle of light and also depending on where you stand. Hung over the indoor waterfall, the sculpture added a shimmering sun-like warm presence over the dark stone slate wall. 
often described as a meditative space, like an oasis in the middle of the busy uh, Midtown Manhattan. Japan Society's indoor gallery shows this work that may have provided a point of concentration while meditating. I once read somewhere that there is a Zen practice of staring at a circle until you stop seeing it. The vague reference came to my mind while I was installing this work at Japan Society. But I also want to bring up this work to complicate the assumed relationship in our contemporary culture between Zen and minimalism. Zen has certainly become a common word. It's been used as an adjective even. Like people might say, I remain Zen about such and such things or I am decorating my room in a Zen style, so on and so forth. Minimalism and Zen are certainly not the same, for sure. And I would point out that Mariko Mori's ring embodies in its form and concept, the long journey she has taken far and wide from ancient stone circles in Northern Japan to Buddhist traditions to even Stonehenge in England. A circle was one of the forms that she found to be a condensed form of various human spiritual exercises, expressions, and practices. And most importantly, the symbol of oneness and unity. In her case, most importantly, as the coexistence with nature. It is interesting to think about Kengo Kito's work and how his works fit into this narrative or not. He himself has stated that when he began his hula hoop installations, it was for a large museum gallery and he was tasked to fill that space. As a painter, it was natural for him to consider the possibility of how to draw in space and fill it with colors. The hula hoop gave him the opportunity to free himself from the boundary of flat surface. His initial concern may have been a purely formal one required by the circumstances, but as he continues to work in this method of taking a circle, transforming it into a line, and then connecting it to the next one, then the next, and so forth, he came to realize that this has been the way he conceived of many other works, by finding a point of engagement with the great continuum of the macrocosmic scale and how to make it visible. From the contemporary artist views, what fascinates them is how abstract ideas like the continuum in the case of Kito can be manifested in certain forms. Different artists utilize different methods and their search for the individual method is equivalent to the search for the authentic self, which the 10 ox herding story shows us all. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Miwako. That was fascinating as well. I always love listening to your ideas and thoughts on these important connections in art. And I just want to let everyone know that Miwako is the person who suggested that we work with Kengo Kito and bring his work to Japan as Los Angeles. So thank you again, Miwako. You brought a lot of joy <laughs> to so many people with this suggestion. Kito-san's work has really been very, very appreciated by a lot of people visiting in Los Angeles and Japan House LA. Now I'd like to invite Duncan back onto the screen as well so we can have a little discussion about all of these, well not all of these ideas, I think it would take us weeks <laughs> to, to cover everything, but I'd like to take a few minutes for us to have a little discussion to connect some of the thoughts and ideas in both of your presentations and then we'll open up to audience questions because there are some questions out there. But I'm going to take advantage of my position here and ask you the first question. It's a question that I think very much relates to what we're talking about. And Miwako, you actually touched on it a little bit um, in your presentation. The question is about the possible role of contemporary art in helping people attain enlightenment. And enlightenment is this profound understanding about, of the true nature of everything, <laughs> the universe, ourselves and everything. In my understanding of Zen, it's, it's often described as direct experience. 
I know that Zen, the word Zen itself means meditation, but a big part of the teaching is this idea of direct experience and attaining enlightenment through direct experience rather than through physical, intense physical or intellectual striving. This enlightenment can be something that happens very suddenly in response to a riddle or koan or when looking at a master's work of calligraphy, or even watching a frog jump into a pond, for example. This exhibition of Kengo Kito's work, one of the things that we've been seeing is that many of our visitors are having very immediate and very emotional reactions to Kito-san's colorful hula hoop installation and to the message of unity that is fairly quickly visible. Do you think that what they're experiencing when they're looking at his art is something similar to this direct experience in Zen? That's a big question, but I thought maybe I'd put that to Duncan first and then Miwako. It's, I'm basically saying, can you, if you come to Japan House Los Angeles to see this exhibition, can you become enlightened on the spot, I guess? But I am sort of being serious about the potential for art to have that effect? So first of all, I think it's not just Zen Buddhism, but Buddhism in general is ultimately about perspective. Having an ability to, whether it's sudden or gradual, a perspective that shifts, that uh, takes something that was binding and constraining into something that is liberative and free. And so that can theoretically be done at any moment in any place. And that's mm -hmm. why there are many teachings about, as you're just saying, a frog going into a pond or a stone hitting a bamboo fence or anything can be the trigger to shift that perspective. And uh, whether Kito's work does that for you or not, that's up to your karmic you know, situation. But I do think there is a maybe a deeper point, which is that it doesn't have to be some kind of you know sanctuary that's treated in a transcendent way. The whole point of that last frame of ten oxidating pictures is it's meant to suggest that in the dusty market world of the everyday and the mundane, that's where mm -hmm. you may discover that which will shift perspective as well. Mm -hmm. And so I was thinking of a different line in Dogen's ancient mirror text where he says, the sutras can sometimes take the form of trees and stones. And he calls the trees and stones round mirrors. So what he's saying is that it can be even stones and, and that anything can be the trigger where you're learning something. And so I think the idea of both the kind of material that's used in this exhibit, as well as the color, it defies, as I think Miyoko is you know, gesturing toward this, we have this image of Zen as being that which is minimalist or drab in color and so on and so forth, but it doesn't have to be, and it can be a hula hoop that does that perspective shift. Thank you, Duncan. And Miwako, would you like to add sure. something to that? I really appreciate how uh, Duncan just uh, explained how it can be the moment of realization or enlightenment can come from different materials or encounters with different objects or people even. And I really like to think of this kind of Zen satori or enlightenment, like we tend to think of it as something like you're reaching the goal or you know, it's something that's so like expansive and that, that's it, like you, you find all the truth about everything. But I would like to think of it more as like a continuation of small enlightenment in everyday living. So it's like the continuing practice. So if we think of them practice and the moment of enlightenment in that way, I think contemporary art does have similar function in terms of providing people to really look at the space in a different way as Kito's hula hoop installation does, or like a Mariko's video work that really transports you to some like a mysterious emotional sphere that individual uh, viewer might have different moment of some kind of realization out of it. So I think in that way, contemporary art has a similar kind of engagement with the spectators. Mm -hmm. 
And I think there it often I've noticed a lot of artists don't give their contemporary artists give call their work untitled. They don't want to tell their audience how to look at their art because they want the audience to have their own reaction to it. And it, it seems to be they don't want to interfere with that experience that the, the individuals are having when they encounter their art. We're getting a few interesting questions popping up on the screen here, but Duncan, did you want to add anything more to that? I'm happy to take any other questions as well. This, this one that's coming up is actually, I had another question myself, but it connects with one of the questions that has just come in, in the Q and A. And please put your questions in the Q and A and not the chat, please. Cause that's what I'm monitoring. With Kengo Kito's hula hoops, um, he has described his hula hoops as these plastic, basically, tubes that are, are made into circles and they contain air or emptiness <laughs> and then so inside the tube is nothing and then when a hula hoop is formed out of a, a line of plastic it frames nothing emptiness and so one of the interesting conversations we had with kito san when he was talking about his work was that he filled these spaces with these hula hoops that he connected to each other but each of these hula hoops contains emptiness and frames emptiness. And so even though he's filling the gallery, he's filling it with emptiness. <laughs> so is it empty or is it full? And that seems like a very Zen, a conundrum, a koan in itself is, you know, when you fill a gallery full of, you know, interconnected hula hoops, is it really full? That was my kind of observation or comment, but it uh, connects with one of our audience members' question about formlessness and the idea of formlessness, but the circle, it is actually still a form. So is it a true way? The question is actually addressed to you, Duncan. Is the circle a true way or of expressing this concept of formlessness and the process and realization? around that and the audience member is an artist whose medium is visual and so he is conflicted about representing this truth visually so there's a lot hanging on your answer Duncan. <laughs> <laughs> I see well I have no idea if this answer will make any sense but you know there is uh, this conundrum right so mm -hmm. what do you do when you are trying to say that everything is subject to impermanence and subject to interconnectivity and that yourself or any selves or any phenomenon is therefore empty. So in the Zen tradition, there's this kind of impulse to want to answer that question, perhaps mm -hmm. in the way, Mary, you suggested you're both what containing and framing at the same time, empty, you know, you need to double the emptiness because if the notion of not being able to see things are empty of solidness, empty of autonomy, but rather interlinked and always subject to change. And that's the reality you're trying to get people to see that mm. we are living in this, what Buddhists call the jewel net of Indra, that we live in this net where we're like mirrors to each other and can see each other and each other and, and, and always shifting and changing. And that's, I think, maybe a kind of direction that Kito's work is showing us, but you have to do it in a smart way where you can't get attached to emptiness. So you're doing the emptiness to get disattached from one thing, but then if you get attached to the circle or attached to the emptiness, that's causing another attach, another problem. So, mm. so you need solutions that do the double work or show the inside outside or, or, or that kind of thing. So, so that's what's I think smart about the empty hula hoop, you know? Mm. Uh, is, is trying to do that in, in a single stroke. Mm -hmm. And so maybe the answer is that you have the form there to guide you, but if you, you cling too much to that form, you will not be able to get there. That you have to, you use it as a guide like the ox, <laughs> but then right. you have to let it go. So that's the basic metaphor in Buddhism, right? You, you have a kigan, kigan, you know, like this shore, another shore, you need a boat to get over there, you know, a land of difficulty and a land of freedom. And that vessel or vehicle that's going to take you over there is not the thing to cling to, but it is necessary to get you there. And mm -hmm. so the form sometimes helps you uh, mm -hmm. to get over there. And if it doesn't, that's when you let go of that form. Mm -hmm. That's Great. really interesting because I think there is an analogy in contemporary art too. Like oftentimes when certain artists finds their 
what they believe to be their own style and mm -hmm. establishes it and you know becomes successful through that style then they get too attached to that style and they start to repeat themselves there's mm -hmm. so much attachment to this this one form and that limits their potential that could you know develop even more styles or forms so mm -hmm. you know it's very interesting to see this kind of parallel in you know zen or contemporary art uh, both of which i think philosophically sort of encourages us to be free always try not to be stuck in one perspective like duncan you said it's the you know shifting perspective this is the continuous act of shifting perspective and i truly think that's what contemporary artists always try to do mm -hmm. Now we've had a couple of questions. I'm noticing that time is flying by very quickly, but so I want to bring in a few more audience questions. We've had a couple of questions about the difference between minimalism and Zen. Miwako, so you touched upon the connection between minimalism and Zen in a lot of people's minds in the West in particular. And, but what do you see as the relationship between Zen and the well-accepted minimalism lifestyle and design in Japan. Um, it's a big question. I, I understand that. We had that a similar question from somebody when they registered. It's not in the Q and A, but it was a pre-submitted question about Zen lifestyle. And whatever you'd like to <laughs> say in response to that would be very welcome. I think the relationship between Zen and minimalism in the art historical sense, mm -hmm. I think the relationship goes both ways. Some minimalist artists find Zen Buddhist philosophy to further develop their idea about how to get rid of any uh, extraneous elements from their formal presentation of their work. But some other artists keeps working from their own philosophy, their understanding of the world, and suddenly finds the connection between Zen. And so their discovery or their encounter with Zen comes afterwards, and then it's mutually beneficial in that way. So relationship goes both ways. And in terms of the sort of popularization of Zen style minimalism, is that it's completely co-opted into this like <laughs> commercialization. So mm -hmm. it's very difficult to get the essence of Zen, but at the same time, I'm not completely opposed to it too. I'm not a purist. If, if you live in an environment which is designed in a very minimalistic way, if that leads you to develop more curiosity about learning different cultures, then I think it's okay. But I think we need to always keep our minds open to learning new things, new, new knowledge. Mm -hmm. I think that also goes back to what Duncan was saying earlier. We need to talk about the sixth Zen patriarch, describing the circle as a, a vast space lacking nothing and having nothing in excess. I think that's very similar to the idea of minimalism that you... <laughs> You, you just have what you need, and nothing more, nothing less. So there is a little bit of a, maybe, do we want to say that the sixth patriarch invented minimalism? Is that, <laughs> does it go that far back in time? But yes, it is. It's a Western art history term, really. It's not something that was, that necessarily existed as a concept in Japan, the idea of minimalism until the 20th century. Duncan, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? The idea of Zen and its relationship with minimalism. I guess today I'm fixated on Zen Master Dogen from the 13th century, but he has another text uh, called Tenzo Kyokun. Tenzo is the name of the, the head cook in a monastery, and Kyokun means like guidelines or instructions too. And, you know, it has a bit of that kind of like, don't waste anything in your kitchen and make sure you're, you know, there is a kind of philosophy there that's about using everything in the monastic kitchen, but still making something that isn't excessive or unnecessary or unneeded, but just enough to uphold the physical as well as spiritual nourishment of everyone in the monastery. And so the Zen cook has to do two things. One is know what's in the kitchen, and two, with whatever's in the kitchen, even if it's not great ingredients, you got to make a just good enough meal 
to <laughs> nourish everyone. Not excessive, so minimalist in that sense, but also not highlighting what you have. And this is a basic notion that suggests that actually Zen is much more, it's on the one hand, yes, it's about stripping away excess, mm -hmm. but it's also about combining whatever you've got. Mm -hmm. And so it's also about layering and putting things together that's in your kitchen. And of course the kitchen is, there is a literal kitchen, but it also means yourself. So when you mm -hmm. look at yourself and take an inventory What's there? We've got some rotting things, some good things. All of us have good things, bad things in our personality, right? But you make the best of what you have and you layer that together, combine it together. And so that suggests complexity as well as simplicity. And it's always the challenge of a cook to figure what the middle path is, uh, is on that. That's a wonderful teaching, wonderful analogy, uh, just before dinner time as well. We have a, another really interesting question here that's very connected with what we've been discussing. Um, this is to both of you. Do you think staying with one idea or style as an artist could be like staying with a form of meditation in Zen Buddhism? So repetition, you're repeating the same actions over time and that actually be freeing one from styles. By repeating the same style, you free yourself from the style and maybe, so, so perhaps, that's another way of looking at what you were saying about artists holding on to the same style and kind of getting too attached to it, but perhaps it's actually liberating for some artists. So it's a different, so maybe it's not, it could be seen as not so bad to be attached to that one style because it could actually be liberating. But that was a very interesting question and comment. Yeah, that's uh, from, very interesting. From an artist. I'm, I'm not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. It, it comes from I think actually practicing it. Yes, I'm. I'm not a practicing artist, so it's very good to hear from artists how they engage with their medium. One artist that comes to mind immediately is like Old Kawara. I'm not saying that he is. He was practicing Zen Buddhism, but Old Kawara's date painting. He started in sixties, and he just he kept doing it until he passed away. So it's a kind of daily practice for him, which is very kind of almost like a Zen Buddhist kind mm -hmm. of engagement with his yeah. own style and medium. Yeah. And Yoshito Monara. <laughs> <laughs> that's a thing that he's continued his career. He does, it yeah. Each painting, painting is a struggle for him. And that in itself is a self-discipline that he speaks to as a painter. He's a painter through and through. So. Yeah, you know, it reminds me of this kind of eternal debate between do you attain freedom through form? You know, mm -hmm. you do that form and as you were saying, do it repetitively. And in that repetition and in that form, you find some liberation or do you flip it and in the freedom, find the form? And there's a famous funny dialogue about Zen meditation cushions in a temple in America. There's this very famous Tibetan Buddhist teacher who's talking about like how at their Tibetan temples, they would have, you know, all the meditation cushions and they weren't in a row. Some were pink, some were all these different colors. And then this Japanese Zen Buddhist teacher was talking about, oh no, in our thing, we keep everything straight and it's all black and it's all. And then they realize that it's just two different styles. Sometimes the Tibetan teacher was saying, look, you do the freeway, and over time, the people who are serious, they will develop a form and discipline, you know, or you can flip it and do it the form, and in that, over time, find the freedom. So it's not like one thing is better than the other. It's just people approach things differently. But I think that's a kind of enduring question that we all have to figure out ourselves. Great. I am noticing that we only have a couple of minutes left. There were a couple of rather big questions that I don't think we have time for. And I apologize to audience members for not being able to squeeze those in. They would have just taken <laughs> a long time to explain. But I would like to thank you both for spending your time with us today. This has been really a lot of fun and very, very thought provoking. I'm sad to have to wrap it up. Um, on behalf of everyone here, I'd like to thank Duncan Williams and Miwako Tezuka for this illuminating, dare I say, enlightening 
discussion of Zen and contemporary art. We do actually have a few more webinars coming up in July and August, including the next installment of our webinar series that explores the concept of Ma in different cultural realms. And that's going to connect quite nicely with today's talk because Ma is a term that refers to space and pauses in time. And it's uh, very important in traditional Japanese culture. And we did have a question from somebody specifically about Ma. So I encourage those of you who are interested to join that webinar on July 29th. The theme will be Ma in contemporary Japanese architecture and the guest who will join professors Hitoshi Abe and Ken Oshima will be Professor Manabu Chiba of Tokyo University, who is a renowned architect. And he'll be talking about Ma in his architecture and his designs in particular. We're very excited that we'll be having the next webinar that is part of the Reconnecting Exhibition Programming on forest bathing, Shinrin Yoku, on August the 18th. So if you're interested in that whole relationship with nature, human's relationship with nature and that whole circle, um, please join us on August the 18th. Um, and you can uh, stay up to date on all our programs by subscribing to the Japan House LA newsletter and checking out our website at japanhouselosangeles.com. Today, when you exit the program, please take a moment to fill out our survey to help us provide content that's relevant to your interests. And thank you all for joining us today. And a huge thank you to Miwako and Duncan for spending time with us and sharing their vast knowledge with us this evening. Thank you both so much. And thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Um, enjoy the rest of your day and stay safe. Bye-bye.